Welcome to the only talk show hosted by the lovable legend, Bigfoot. Hey world, my name is Bigfoot and this is Ranger number 47. Please introduce yourself. My name is Yogi Pollywall. I'm a comedian and I live in Brooklyn. I'm from Seattle originally. Yogi's a pretty cool name. Thanks, How, man. How'd your parents come up with that? My legal name is not Yogi, and what my legal name is was supposed to be my older brother's name, but then when he was born, somebody else with that name in my grandmother's hometown almost poked their eye out. So my grandma was like, no, you can't name him Yogesh, which is what my name is. So when I was born, they're like, well, we got the other name laying around. We might as well give this kid that name. So my legal name is Yogesh Polywool. I mean, it's it's still, I mean, so Yogi would be an abbreviation of that name then, right? Yeah, it's just a nickname. Been called it my entire life. It's been good to me. I've been good to it. I feel like the name Yogi fits me. I don't know, how do you feel about being named Big? The Notorious B-I-G? Yeah. Not so much the notorious part, but you know, I, 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 I do like the, the compliments that I get with it. You know, the big feet, big penis thing. Of course, of course. I find your style to to really have that that endearing quality. Like it, you know, you I I don't say this about many men, but you are quite adorable. Oh, well, thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. And, and I mean, with, with your 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 comic style, you have matured quite a bit in your comic uh, style. You used to do broad topics, mm -hmm. and now you're pretty much all about unity. And, I mean, do you? What, what was your breakthrough in that moment? You know, there was a psychological switch I had to make in my act. I was doing a comedy competition in Utah, and I was about 23, and I was performing to like middle-aged uh, Mormons, conservative, and they liked me, but they didn't love me. And I thought to myself, I could do stand-up for 10 years and get great at entertaining this crowd, but 10 years later, they're not gonna become to comedy clubs people my age would be. So I decided to stop writing jokes that are more broad and focus on the things that I like because the people that will like me will probably like the things that I like. So I just started writing stand-up about music and about how I feel about the world. And um, I think that um, I bombed with it for like eight months. I was really bad at it. But I got good at it eventually, and uh, it, now it's the only style I like to write in. And I think all of my stand-up is informed by David Tell and Galifianakis. I want to be as vulnerable as Galifianakis and try and write as many jokes like David Tell would. You have done quite a bit. You made an album, mm -hmm. and you also have the 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 late the early late late show. The early sure the early late show. The early late show. It was a show that me and Chris Lear produced in the Seattle area. It was a fake late night show that we did, and it was um, it was a tremendous success. It was uh, the year before I moved to New York, and I told myself I want to do something in Seattle that I don't know if I could do in New York. I want to do a really cool, fun project. And at the time, people weren't paying comedians on the shows, and people weren't bringing uh, headliners to Seattle outside the clubs. And um, a comic Brian Cook would do that a lot and he had left for LA so I thought like ah, I should probably try and do some of these shows and so I decided to do a show where everyone got paid we bring in two headliners from out of town and we charged uh, money for the tickets because we wanted the audience to know we're gonna put on a quality show and we packed the rendezvous out a few times we did four of them there and then we did the last one at Bumbershoot and it was uh, one of the greatest things I got to do in my life it was really fun and I think anyone that got to see it got to see a really really fun thing I mean, and plus, it also combined your music love, you know, being at Bumper Shoot too, so. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, that, that, like, getting to do music festivals has been super cool because I loved going to these festivals my entire life. So, I got to be someone that went to Sasquatch every year to a guy that now gets to perform in it, and it's one of the most fun things I get to do. My career is at a point where I get, like, two or three cool things every year or so. And honestly, cool. Fucking fantastic. I love it. I, I wish I was doing more things, obviously. You want to work hard and try and do the best work you can. You want to have idols like Randy Moss, you know? Yeah. Make sure you go to Randy U, the hard, hard working part of college. And uh, I just, uh, I really love where I'm at right now. 
is the Big Apple like uh, like the mecca for for comedians? I think that New York definitely is the city to be if you want to try to become a great comic. The greatest comedians uh, ever have performed, if not started, in New York. And if you're not impressive in that city, I don't think you can prove your worth in the rest of the country. Um, it's a difficult place to be, and I'm certainly not great at being there. But I will say that um, I, if you want to act, L.A. is the place to be. There's more opportunity. There's opportunity to act in New York. I haven't seen much of it. But I do think that for comedians that live in New York, they want to see great comics in that city. And uh, it's a great scene to be part of, even though I wish I was a part of a bigger part of it. But what would you share to people that were getting into comedy uh, that you've learned? I mean, um, honestly, for amazing people. <sighs> and I mean, you yourself are now starting to headline your own stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it's been pretty fun. Um, I think that anybody starting stand up should know that if uh, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Uh, it sucks a lot, but there are moments that are great, and that's I think what's amazing about stand up. It's a, truly a field where you earn every laugh and you control it, and people that have done stand-up have gone on to do other great things from Judd Apatow to Al Franken and I just think that when it comes to being a performer uh, when you do your best you know it and when you don't you feel disappointed but have fun doing it because if you're not having fun it's a long fucking road even if you think you want to stay in it for as long as you want you got to start having fun if you're not having fun how do you have that drive to to keep writing up new material like I want the audience in front of me to see a new set. If this is your first time seeing me, this I hope this is you really enjoy it. Cause um, here's your lighter, by the way. Um, and uh, you want me to light it? You got it. Oh, Bigfoot, you got it. I just realized that your fingers are so thick you, they can't burn. But I'll do it for you. You got it. Go, Take Bigfoot, go. Um, what was the question? What were we talking about? Uh, oh, write new material yeah, and di new different material. shit in the East Coast. Uh, when I moved to the East Coast, I learned that I had to speak slower and be more attackive, be more on the attack when I did my material. And uh, if you don't write new material, then uh, you never get to see an audience be satisfied twice. Okay. And I want people that see me again to really like what I do. And when it comes to performing on the East Coast, I have to like talk a little slower and be a little louder, I think. But uh, I love doing it. It makes you a better comic. You have to be able to perform in every arena. Is there tricks that you, you tend to, to handle the audience? I think that, um, yeah, I try and uh, where I stand on stage, I make a note of that. Because I find that um, if it's a, season, a decent sized stage, you can actually work even two feet by standing in the back of two feet or in front of it. And I think that um, great comedians really put on a show and uh, I like those that use the space. I think that that's uh, a part of being a theatrical performer. When you created your album, what mm -hmm. was that like? So that show was produced before I moved to New York and it was just like, a, hey, this is the material I've written in my time here. Let's see how it uh, stacks up to the rest of my life, basically. And uh, we record it at uh, Columbia City Theater. Um, and it's a theater where Jimi Hendrix performed at. So go check it out. It's a good album. Not his, mine, but both. And um, it was recorded in 2014. And it took me a long time to figure out how to get it to the internet and to people. Yeah. But uh, by uh, 2016, I got it out to people. And uh, it's a fun album. It's a good listen. And it's zany. Do you have any new projects that you're working on? I do. Bigfoot, you're on your shit. I am on shit. Um, so I'm performing at your cousin's festival, Sasquatch. Oh, yeah. Um, and oh, it's the same name. It's like dude or, dude or bro. All right. Well, then I'm going to your, I'm going to <laughs> your kin's festival. Um, and uh, I'm going to be performing in Calgary as well uh, for the Funny Fest, uh, June 5th through 7th. All dates on yogipolywall.com. Figure out how to spell it. Um, and uh, other than that... You can find all my updates online. I uh, I started, me and a friend started a comedy record label in Brooklyn. His name is Gabriel Smith. We started Lighted Through Records, and we've been making comedy audio EPs for comedians that we think are great in New York, and we're releasing those. And me and another comic, Patrick Hasty, started a web series called Know Your Cool, 
and it's featuring New York Comics, and we film a show a few times a year, and we release them as a web series. And check out all that stuff online. It's on the internet, and I just said it. This will be up probably in a few days, but today you're you're going to the Crocodile. Today I'm going to be performing at the Crocodile. Uh, this weekend I'll be at the Comedy Underground, and then the weekend after that I'll be in Portland featuring at Harvey's. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll be at the Comedy Nest later in May. And yeah, I'm in town for a little bit doing shows before Sasquatch. And um, I'm seeing my family and my uh, beautiful girlfriend. Hey, yo, buddy. Yeah, them cabbie cones. I haven't had them in a while. I, I, I like the, the strong. They're stuff. good. They're good. I had to give them up. How come? Shit's illegal in New York. I ain't fuck with that. Oh, so you live in New York now? Yeah, yeah I live in Brooklyn. Oh, cool. Yeah. Do you, uh, are you kind of a comic book guy? No. Oh, shit, man. If I comic books were like books that like immigrant parents were like, why would you buy a short book? Like, they, like, it, like some parents were just like, fuck that. Eight pages? What the fuck are you talking about? Nah, you're gonna get a book. All right. I love comic books. Listen, I don't, I, I completely get it. But co people that are comic book fans are real shitty to people that aren't, but like could be on the border. For some reason, we're made to feel like chumps because we didn't read when we went to bed. My, we're too busy jerking off. <laughs> hey, my wife does. I she doesn't know anything about comic books. Uh huh. And I took her to the San Diego Comic Con. Uh huh. And I was like, "Baby, you gotta dress up as a superhero." Sure, like, sure, yeah. Let it. So she dressed up as the Green Lantern. Uh huh. Dude, she got mobbed by so many dick. Like there was so many guys that were just like. And they were like asking her Green Lantern questions, and she didn't know. And they were like, "Oh, you're a poser," you know. Uh, right. So right. my wife has a really right. bad taste, well, you know, when it comes to like us comic nerds. Yeah. And I was like, "That's not even fair for like for that." Well, I'll tell you what. Experience. It is unfair for a large group of people to judge a group of people by the worst population. That's just always true. Right. So in this case, I do feel like. Comic book nerds that are shitty are often more known than just like decent people that like comic books. And that's, that's you know what? Sorry, buddy, that sucks. Sorry to hear that. But comic book people that are shitty are real shitty. Call them out more and they'll stop being shitty. I, I have to ask you an, an off question. What, what is your fascination with Bob Ross? Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I believe my Twitter bio still is president of the Bob Ross fan club and no one has denounced it so I do believe I get to claim it this is a recorded interview we have witnesses here and I want the world to know that I am the adjunct defunct okay. Bob Ross president fan club I feel like you should have a perm in order to have that, that captain title well you know what Bigfoot then you wouldn't know that Bob Ross hated having that haircut because Bob Ross wanted to stand out among other painters when he had his logo put on paintbrushes. Yes. Right. <laughs> he hated it. I, I, I there was do follow somebody, art the world. Somebody, <laughs> <laughs> somebody in a boardroom had to say, hey, Bob, you got to keep the hair. Bob, come on. Yeah. The hair, buddy. We're selling so much art tools. Come on, Bob. It, it, did, it, make it, it did make him stand out. It did make him stand out. But I think that um, Bob Ross is a uh, American icon because... His entire goal was to make the world paint, yet he did such a good job of painting that we were just distracted by his charm. Most people that watch Bob Ross don't paint along. Have you painted along? Have you? I'm seeing no's all around, and even the birds are agreeing with me at this point. The point is, um, Bob Ross lived a life where he tried his best and he uh, died too young. And I think that his legacy in American television should be remembered because without um, great people on TV showing us how we could all be amazing, we wouldn't be inspired to do great things. Wow. Yeah. Um, well said. Thank you. I yes. know that you kind of dabble in like pecan butter. That's right, and, I do. And uh, gourmet cheeses. Would you call yourself a foodie? I don't think I'd call myself a foodie because I don't complain that much when food's bad because I spent my summers going to India and when you are deprived from American culture pre-internet you just think about like the dumbest things to crave like everyone craves like Olive Garden breadsticks but nobody craves like 
nacho cheese from a ballpark unless you're like really sad in life. So uh, I love all American food and uh, convenience stores in America are a way to know how safe a neighborhood is. All you have to do is see what variety of nuts they have. Because if there's pistachios, it's a safe neighborhood. You don't have to worry about anything. If they don't have peanuts at all, run. Okay. Get out of there. Uh, it's a... Word, word slip by. <laughs> <laughs> what's your... What's your uh, a food that you're homesick for, like uh, from India? That like, what's, the, what's the shit? Like, we're... What do I like? What do I miss when I'm not in India to eat? There's this uh, guy that runs a cart, and he makes these like, like street sandwiches. There, it's like this thin. It's this Indian bread which is thinner, and he adds some chutney on it, and like an onion and cheese, and he just closes up and he batters it with some uh, ghee, and he just puts some clamps on it, and it's just like done in a few minutes, and then he just puts ketchup on top, and it's like. It's just great, disgusting street food. That's what I miss in India. There's amazing food in India, but I love this dude's, like, honestly, okay sandwich. Like, when it comes to sandwiches, right now I've been fucking up some Venezuelan sandwiches. That shit's delicious. It's so good. But this Indian dude's cart, I, I love it. I miss it. It's good. Well, um, now that you found Bigfoot, do you have any other questions for me? Bigfoot, you mentioned earlier that going to the bathroom, going to the loo for our Australian viewers, um, is difficult because of the, your hair. Do you have a toilet paper brand you'd recommend? Scott, Charmin, I, you know, Lufas. I, I, I like I like Charmin, uh -huh. but no matter what I buy, it's gotta be two ply. Two ply. But they got this shit now, it's three ply. Three ply? Oh. That's like the three liter soda. Too much. No, Too much, it's America. It's like wiping your ass Pull back. Silk. Silk. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, if I have any other questions, I haven't asked yet. Uh, Atta kid. Come on, round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So now, now I'm all right. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> so yeah. can I stop? Is that all right? Yeah, you can absolutely, man. Like it's not a. You force. got me to a park and you've you've drugged me. You truly are a monster, Bigfoot. I was on your side the entire time, but now I see the true you. <laughs> well, wait till I pull out the whiskey. Oh no! <laughs> Thus the seducing begins. Sorry. Ranger Yogi, thank you so much. Thank it you. was a pleasure. Uh, all right, welcome back to Washington. Yogi Polly Wall. <laughs> you want me to light it again? Yeah. Yeah. You got it, buddy. I believe in you. In now, in now. There you go.